ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, uh, to speak um, about the rule of law can be both very easy or very difficult. Easy for the principles summed up by the concept of the rule of law are not uh, only accepted by revered, even worshipped everywhere in our time. Freedom under the rule of law is repeatedly proclaimed as the core definition by Western democracies, by all the leaders of the democratic world. The World Bank and International Monetary Fund condition their financial assistance on the implementation of the rule of law in recipient countries as the only means to provide a secure environment for investments, property, contracts, and market economy. I do not know of any philosopher or statement who dares to openly challenge the rule of law as such. I never heard any encomium of the lawlessness of the arbitrary as a principle. Leaders of a variety of systems, some of which has rejected democracy and individuals' rights, uh, and many of which oppose liberalism and are explicitly anti-Western, claim their support for the rule of law and even identify it as essential. Forgetting that Hobbes, in his Leviathan, stated that he that is bound to himself only is not bound. Many abuses of the law have been conducted by states and government officials who claim to embrace and abide by the rule of law. Hypocrisy is, uh, as we all know, only too well, the highest homage of vice to virtue. Even the most despotic rulers of our times pretend to obey the laws. This unanimity in support of rule of law is a feat unparalleled in history. It would not be very difficult to show that the notion of the rule of law may become meaningless due to ideological abuse and general overuse. That is why I said before speaking about the rule of law may be extremely uh, difficult. Claimed as a universal principle of legitimating power, the concept of rule of law can be either a truthful recognition of the moral essence of the state or a cover for cynical political leaders who do lip service in favor of the rule of law while violating it. But on the other hand, the mere fact of its frequent repetition is compelling evidence that adherence of the rule of law is an accepted measure worldwide of government legitimacy. No other single political ideal has ever achieved such a universal endorsement. The rule of law thus stand in the peculiar state of being the preeminent legitimating political ideal in the world of today without any agreement upon precisely what it means. To complicate things further, the scholarly debate about the concept of rule of law, its past and present, as well as most important, its future, engage political scientists, philosophers, historians, and lawyers, trying to understand better both the definition and the limitation of a notion which may seem universal and undisputable to the layman, but proves itself highly problematic to the theorist. A striking disjunction exists between the theoretical discourse of the rule of law and the political and public discourse of the rule of law. Some believe that the rule of law includes protection of individuals' rights. Some think that democracy is part of the rule of law, some not. Some believe that the rule of law includes protection of individual rights, and some not. 
one thinks the rule of law is purely formal in nature, or, on the contrary, that the rule of law is substantial, encompassing the social, economic, educational, and cultural condition under which people's legitimate aspiration and dignity may be realized. I understand why there are, in theory, so many contradictions and nuances in defining the rule of law in relation to our complex world, in which innumerable transitions, cultures, and historical experiences blend and confront each other. The concept was born more than 2,000 years ago when Pindar forges first the image of King Low Nomos Basileus and when Herodotus quoted him to oppose the rule of law and single man, the Persian monarch, to the rule of Greek law. Such a concept cannot cross two millennia many internal contradictions. As a practitioner, both on the law and of governments, governance, but even more as a citizen, I will try to contribute to a practical definition of the rule of law starting from the opposite viewpoint, from its absence. As with air or water, it is easier to perceive what the rule of law means when we lack it. I strongly believe that the many of the contradiction of such a basic concept disappear if only we reflect a while about how the rule of law can itself disappear from a given society and what are the consequences of its absence. All of us accept that the liberty and justice are eternal ideas of the mankind. We are proud of the great masterpieces of literature, music, and art inspired by love, fight, or death for liberty and justice. We are less willing to admit that the same great ideals have inspired doctrines heated for destroying of some communities and peoples. The doctrines put into effect with enthusiasm and fanaticism had as in end to humiliation or even the disasters of the nation that have adopted them. It exists a way of think or feel and of life to help us to surpass this overwhelming dilemma of the human being. Could we hope in the dawn of the third millennium that we could make it viable? Listening of a, a French uh, uh, newspaper in uh, one of my uh, recent uh, travel by the plane, at a cultural page, my attention was drawn by a drawing of uh, Rodin's uh, famous nude, uh, The Sinker. Change it so that its original Apollinic figure would become in the same meditative position, the typical accessories of the modern intellectual. Boldness, some belly, and eyeglasses. Something else also appeared in the drawing. A cannonball gripped through uh, thick uh, chains by the foot of this uh, strange uh, singer. Freedom was written on it in capital letters. Could be the liberty a problem difficult to solve by contemporary intellectual elites after 200 years from the French Revolution? Freedom as a problem difficult to solve by the intellectual elites we have seemed to me a paradox hard a paradox hard to accept if my own experience and the recent one of my nation would not have undergone through in a tragical manner. 23 years ago, I have participated along with my students and my children at the popular rise against the communist dictatorship. Bar 
handed facing the army and the securitates tanks, we were spontaneously roaring, freedom, democracy, free elections. When the soldiers started to shut, the young people have continued to shout, we will die and we will be free. 1,000 people were killed, and over 3,000 were badly hurt those days. Among them, many were close friends of mine. Even if my country was the only one being subject of the bloody separation from the communist dictatorship, it was not the only one which had gained its freedom then. The huge crowds that have occupied in a sudden attempt the squares in Berlin, Prague, Warsaw, Sofia, Riga, Vilnius, have not asked for land, jobs, salaries, or revenge. They have shown an astonishing solidarity for freedom, democracy, justice. Crowds with that the huge communist repression forces facing them proved weak and helpless. By all means, 1989, we remain in the history as one of those miraculous years when people were willing to fight and to die for an ideal. Yet, ungrateful and painful was the fight during the years that have followed. We were to understand very fast that the free elections have brought into power the second echelon of the communist nomenclature and political police. That so-called market economy allowed to be set up an oligarchic system led by the former Securitate Mafia. That freedom and democracy were used to urge a part of the population against the others <coughs> in order to reactivate the inter-ethnic conflicts frozen under the communist dictatorship. I were about to find the answer to my own frustration and also to other frustrations, not in the Western book of politology, psychology, or psychology, but in the Old Testament. I realize that there is not better explanation for the post-communist transition avatars, but the Jewish migration after the liberation from the tyranny of the Egypt pharaoh. The 40 years of peregrination in desert, the exacerbation of conflict between people, the harsh fight for power, the worship, the golden calf, had prevented us with millenniums above on the fact that the essence of the transitions is a change of mentality, and that a major change in mentality takes a generation time. The migration offers a solution to a new society can be built only on the basis on the table of law and of imposing to observe of the law. The New Testament was to bring an essential revision through Jesus' words. Give and Caesars what belonged to the Caesars. Only today we understand this revision's importance, separating the state from the religions as religions offer eternal truths while the law adapts to the social progress. If only after 23 years, the former communist country in Central and Southeastern Europe have acceded in the European Union. It was not only because the social and political transformation happened very fast, but also because of unquestionably role that project of international non-governmental organization have had in establish the rule of law within this part of the world. Those who, in their way for Central and Southeastern Europe to the West, pass through Vienna, 
could read above the gate of Franz Joseph Emperor Palace Cicero's sentence, Justitia Fundamentum Regnum. Justice, the fundament of state, is the very principle that marked the limit between the stable Western societies and the Eastern unstable ones. That could have returned any time under the reign of arbitrary. Through the Treaty of Accession to the European Union, the former communist country in Central South and Southeastern Europe has gained the statute of functional democracies. Does it mean the end of their efforts in setting up the complete rule of law? Absolutely no. However, it means that their experience is now interesting not only for the countries in transition, but also for the advanced democracy, which could sometimes hide unexpected frailties. During uh, a meeting um, I had at the beginning of uh, 2002 with the president, former president of Hungary, Ferenc Madl, uh, we have discussed about his book, the post-communist change through legislation. I have shared with him some observation I had uh, made uh, during the first 10 years of transition. That as time went by, we paid the price for some stale events from our history, when the idea of observing the law and the judicial independence were lacking. The surpass more rapid and more slow of the communist transition could be thus explained. Regarding the future, it is clear to me now that the progress and welfare are not related only to the GDP, the inflation rate, or the balance deficit. And that in the century this has just started, the country's hierarchy will be dictated not by technology, management, nor even by creativity, but by the way human communities will know to assimilate the rule of law and eventually the legislative way of living. It is quite clear to me now that the opposite direction is also possible, which risks not longer come from the history, but much further from the very nature of the man. One of the reasons for which the democratic government must be a constitutional government based on legal norms, as the authors of the American Constitution enacted, is a necessity to settle specific restriction in front of absolute will, whatever if this will belongs to one individual, to some individuals, or to many individuals. As John Adams, and the other founder parents of the American democracy well noticed the absolute rule of the majority could lead to mass tyranny. When the community of values and interests disintegrates, when there is no mutual understanding regarding the fundamental principles and goals, when the participants no longer try to integrate themselves within the state, but try to become the very state it is possible to obtain even the collapse of the democracy. That is why a democratic government is only the constitutional government based on the separation of the powers within the state. During my presidential term, I profoundly and strictly observed the independence of the judicial power. I kept myself a way of influence the justice and I rejected any possibility to intercede in the process of justice. This attitude has attracted the concept of an important part of the public opinion, inclusively of many Democrat intellectuals, friends of mine, who considered there was uh, the time, even not for long, to suspend the independence of the judiciary in favor of some rapid intervention for restoring the justice where there were made evident abuses and illegalities. My answer, that a single teeny infringement 
of separation of powers opens the way for endless abuses did not convince too much or too many. When you are obliged to take decisions, you understand better the sense of the notions than you approach them only virtually. When the revolution started in the street in Romania, was confiscated by the second echelon of the communist nomenclature, a state to protest in the street, because I understood that individual freedom and deed was reached someone else's freedom, and that the freedom of a nation was a form of solidarity which could not realize between oppressors and oppresses. You can understand more profoundly the sense of some notions when you are obliged to take decisions for others. As a chief of state, I understood the difference between fairness and justice. It was true that those who have uh, committed the crime during the communism and those who have uh, rubbed the country goods to be punished, but regaining the dignity of the nation demanded that this to be made, observing some rules. Even this seems a slow course and the time is out of joints. That is why I believe that the lack of respect for law and justice, as well as the proliferation on the theft or improvity in general, cannot be solved only by president, by government, or by parliament. Not even by courts of law, police, or jails. It is proved that private property and the democracy are not sufficient. The lack of the profound respect or trust in a justi judiciary or legal horizon is still grave and profound rooted in collective mentality. Until the family, the school, the church, the opinion of street, of the village, of the neighborhood will not intervene, this dangerous reality could not be changed. I believe this is a necessary measure because there are enough disappointing intellectuals who tend to think that if the principle of law are imperfectly put into practice, then this principle are a trap and the chatting. They seem not to find any balanced term between an excessive optimism and a pessimism, equally excessive. The intellectual become cynical if they could not be idealist any longer. The bitterness of their cynicism often betrays the profoundness of their disappointment. A recurrent fashion in intellectuals' milieus insist on the fact that the rule of law is only an arbitrary uh, convention, that eventually only the brute power could solve the conflict between our preferences. If we do not accept there is a form of reason and conscience to which we could subject for judgment the differences between us, then it could be not longer any alternative than to submit them to the test of force in this fight. Not the wiser reason would prevail, but the stronger fist. The rule of law as a way of living imposes a permanent vigilance toward its infringement by any citizens. So what some could say by now, this is not my problem. It does not concern me, many of us could think. I remind them the verses of the popular song at the time when the Nazism set up in Germany. When one of my neighbors was arrested, I did not protest because I was not a Jew. When another neighbor was arrested, I did not protest it because I was not a social democrat. When I was arrested, 
I had no longer any neighbor to protest. In my view, any society which aspire to institute or reinstate the rule of law must know that this is far from being an automatic process, a sudden and painless epiphany of the law. It is a long and hard struggle, both with the past and with the present. It is a hard struggle to create institutions and a harder one to make them function and work properly. It is a constant struggle, not only for the politicians or the judiciary, but for the society as a whole. It is a struggle not for a day or a year, but for a lifetime. A struggle which needs insight and which needs courage. You certainly remember Plato's dialogue, Crito, in which he depicts Socrates unjustly condemned to death, but who refuses to escape his fate by exile. Even if few of us, philosophers or not, will be confronted as once Socrates was with such a dramatic uh, situation. It is worth thinking to such a fundamental choice to save his or her life in spite of the law or to save his or her conscience even if not his life with and within the law. It is up to each of us to make the right choice. Thank you.